Lecture number seven of our critical thinking unit on the errors of truth, which is basically a misnomer because all of the fallacies that we've gone over so far are errors of truth, but this is just the name I've given to the leftover fallacies that we haven't gone over already. Here's what they're going to be. And before we can talk about our first fallacy, the either or fallacy, we need to talk about the rules of negation. So when you negate something, it doesn't necessarily mean that the opposite is true. For example, if I say someone is not evil, it doesn't mean that they are good because they could be in the middle. If I say I'm not angry, it doesn't mean that I'm the opposite, which is quite happy either. I mean, I could be somewhere in the middle. Uh, a negation does, however, change the meaning to the opposite when we are dealing with a dichotomy. Right? So a dichotomy is when something is divided into only two parts, when we are dealing with a binary system. It's in either this or it's a that system. It's one or the other. There's no areas of gray. If I say that I'm not dead, then I'm saying that I'm alive. Okay? Your, uh, you being alive or you being dead is a dichotomy. It's one or it's the other. Um, so this actually means that contrary to popular opinion, sometimes double negatives uh, are the most accurate way to write something. For example, you might say it's not unusual, or I'm not unhappy. Uh, it's always clearer to say what you actually are, which is why your English teachers are so strict about double negatives, and I am as well. But sometimes all you know is what something isn't. Um, maybe you don't want to quite go out on a limb and say that something is totally usual, but it, at the very least you want to say that it's not unusual, like it, it does happen now and again. Uh, even if it's not completely usual. And maybe you're not quite sure that, there, you know, if you're happy or what emotion you're feeling, but you do know that you're not unhappy. Um, so double negatives do have their place. Uh, you know, they are far more helpful with very technical phrasing that I don't want to get into now. But just know that there's a reason why we discourage you from uh, writing them because it's always more accurate to just say what something is versus say what it's not. Um, but sometimes that's all we know. All right, so let's get on to our first fallacy, which is the either-or fallacy. It's also sometimes called the false dichotomy. It's also sometimes called the black and white fallacy. So a dichotomy is when something is divided into two parts, and a false dichotomy is when you are given two options and there are actually more hidden in there. So you're told things are black and white when there are really shades of gray. So for example, you can either marry me or die alone. This is not true because you can always meet someone on the internet um, or some other option, okay? Those aren't the only two available opportunities. All right, your uh, false dichotomy or true dichotomy. You're either dead or alive. We already talked about that. True, you can't be in between. You're either one or the other. Uh, you are either pregnant or not. True, there's no kind of pregnant state. Uh, you are either with us or against us. Classic false dichotomy. You can uh, be on nobody's team and you can be neutral. Yeah. You either like Pepsi or Coke. False, I hate both of them actually. All right, next fallacy is the fallacy of composition. So composition is when you put things together. So the fallacy of composition occurs when you believe that something about the parts will be true of the whole. So when you, you know, something that's true of the little pieces are also going to be true when you combine them all together. For example, putting the five best rappers into a group will make a band five times better than they were, would be alone. I think if we look at examples of supergroups, that's clearly not true. Uh, the fallacy of division is essentially the opposite. It's when you break things apart. So the fallacy of division occurs when you believe something is true about the whole, and that will be true about the parts. So for example, uh, Mr. X is a member of the best band on earth. This means he must be one of the best musicians on earth. Um, I mean, it just you, there's a ton of examples I can come up with off the top of my head. The third guy in Nirvana, the third guy in the Fugees. Um, there's lots of bands where somebody just got lucky and they were with some really talented members and you know or and here's the thing about the fallacy of division um it ignores the uh important uh role that teamwork plays um there are some you know basketball teams that just j gel really well together and they bring out the best in one another and individually and in other contexts they don't do so well and so what the fallacy of composition and division both ignore is the role that uh, sometimes the context of being with others or, the, uh, or in a different situation um, can bring out different talents. All right, so fallacy of division or composition. Mike is from my least favorite class, so I know he's a bad kid. Fallacy of division. I assume that just because the class as a whole 
was bad, he will be also. He might have just been in a class with a lot of bad apples, but he's actually the one shining light in my otherwise terrible class. All right. This is such a large hotel. I'm sure the rooms will be big. Clear fallacy of division. Just because the whole place is big doesn't mean its parts, the rooms, will also be big. Of course it's a great novel. Every page is full of beautiful language. Fallacy of composition. Every page may have beautiful language, that, but that doesn't mean it will all fit together to make a great novel. Perhaps the conclusion is bunk, but you know each individual sentence is written really well. If we get the best engineers from each country, we will have the best company. Fallacy of composition. Just because they were the best in their country doesn't mean they will work well together. Maybe they speak other languages, have different skill sets, blah, blah, blah. All right, our next fallacy is what's called the gambler's fallacy, and this is a really important one. It rests on a misunderstanding of how statistics work. So the gambler's fallacy assumes that the likelihood of an outcome will increase over time when it actually won't. The classic example of this is I flipped a coin and I got five heads in a row. Therefore, I think it's really likely that it will be tails next. And so essentially what you're assuming is that the statistical likelihood of an event occur, uh, you know, will increase over time um, simply because it hasn't happened in a while. But that's really not the way that statistics work. You have a 50% chance that it will be heads or tails every single time you flip. Um, it is possible that you're going to get 99 heads in a row. And once you've gotten that, you know, that, to that point, the likelihood of that hundredth head occurring is still only 50%. Um, and I know it feels counterintuitive, but that's just how statistics work. Um, this fallacy is kind of the opposite of another fallacy that we won't talk much about, which is called the hot hand fallacy. And the hot hand fallacy essentially assumes that, wow, I'm on a roll here. Um, the, you know, I'm more likely to uh, get a heads the next time because it's been heads all these other times. Uh, but again, that rests on a misunderstanding of how statistics work. They don't build up over time unless you add in some other factor, which we'll talk about now. So is it the gambler's fallacy or is it just a good understanding of how statistics work? Every day I drive, I am less and less likely to get in an accident because I become more experienced. So this doesn't have, actually have much to do with statistics. It's just uh, an understanding of how practice works. So good, it is it is true, it's not the gambler's fallacy, that experience makes you less likely to get in an accident. This counts, of course, until you get you know much older. Um, and so notice how we had to add in something extra. Just based off of driving more and more and more alone, just you know the statistical quality of being in the car more often does not change your likelihood of getting in an accident more or less. But when we add in this extra variable, the variable of you becoming more experienced, um, suddenly then it's a, an okay statement to make. Because then you're make, saying something different. You're saying, the more experienced I am, the less likely I am to get in an accident. And that seems very reasonable. Next one, I've missed every basket today. I'm really likely to get one soon. Okay, gambler's fallacy. The likelihood doesn't go up over time. You might just be no good rogue. Uh, now, if the reasoning was that you get better with practice, that would be different. All right, next fallacy is equivocation. So there's a classical, you know, historical uh, definition of what equivocation is. Uh, you ran into this when you read the play Macbeth. And essentially to equivocate is to uh, assert a half-truth with the intention of misleading the listener. And it's sort of a very broad term for telling partial truths and trying to confuse and lie. We're going to talk about equivocation in a very strict and narrow sense. And that sense is this more modern one, which is to equivocate means to abuse two words that have the same sound. That's it. So if equivocation occurs when you treat two words as one to prove your argument inappropriately. So I think I've already discussed this in class a bit. A feather is light. What is light cannot be dark. Therefore, a feather cannot be dark. So I am fudging the word light here and trying to use it in a couple different ways. And you would actually be surprised how often equivocation occurs um, throughout argumentation. So uh, all of these are examples of equivocation. Find the word that is being equivocated. The sign said a fine for parking here, so I assume it was fine to park here. Fine. There's uh, one version of fine is a ticket or a charge, and the other version of fine is just saying it's okay. 
Nobody's perfect, and I'm a nobody, therefore I'm perfect. What's being equivocated? Nobody. Nobody as in no people versus a not important person. So these were the fallacies of truth, essentially the leftovers at the end of our critical thinking unit. Uh, we made it 